Hello again, it's Mr. Pete, your internet shop teacher. Welcome back to my shop. Now, in the last two videos, I talked about the Parker Vice, and it really was a two-part video, but I have to expand it by popular demand into a three-parter. So bear with me now as I talk just a little bit more about this, maybe make some more improvements uh, upon your suggestions that were in the comments, and show you a few other things that I failed to tell you in the last video. So let's get started. This is tips 593 that you're watching. Be sure and go back if you have not seen these other two parts and uh, check them out. And feel free to subscribe if you think I am worthy. Also, it will help you a lot if you read through the comments in my various videos. Per your suggestions, I went ahead and installed O-rings on both ends of the handle to cut the confound uh, noise when it drops. Thanks for the suggestion, and most Wilton vices come with a big rubber washer right there. Also, you'll get less... Well, you can see that one is too small. It's starting to go into the hole. I'll have to look into the basement, see if I have any more that are larger in diameter and will not go down into the hole. There were quite a few comments about this wallowed out spot here on the slide and several suggested that it was ground out to accommodate a workpiece that they were doing repetitive operations on and that could well be. I had suggested that a workpiece was dropped in there repeatedly, perhaps millions of times. Perhaps an artillery shell up at the Joliet Armory. But I actually made that up, who knows? I have often recommended to people that when you install your vise on a bench to make sure that you have it out sufficiently far such that a long piece of work can be held vertically and will not strike the bench. Now the Charlie Parker vices have this flange on there that uh, would uh, prevent that from happening. But not all vices have that, and I really like that. About half of all bench vices that I see installed uh, during my travels are installed incorrectly. Too far inboard such that vertical work cannot be dropped down to a suitable position. So consider that when you mount your vices. Quite a few people agreed with me that they do not like vices on a swivel base, but that most vices that are offered in box stores are sold with the swivel base. Often they do not tighten up sufficiently or they wobble around. Sometimes they raise the vise up higher to accommodate that extra thickness, but not always. But I don't particularly like them, although I do have a Wilton in the other garage. You've seen it with pipe jaws. These are cheap pipe jaws. This is not a very good vice, but uh, that, that's just uh, some of the comments that I got. It's starting to rain. Also, have you noticed that almost all cheaper vices now have the slide or the ram made of channel iron? And it must be incredibly cheap to make these compared to a full-blown cast piece that has to be machined. I don't like them. I don't believe they have the strength or the accuracy. But you get what you pay for. But really, what this video is all about is the bottom of this vise. The rough cast bottom that was not machined. And I was chastised by about 50% of the viewers for not machining this. Well, part of my reason is uh, slothfulness, as well as I like to keep things as authentic as I can, and machining this is not authentic. But that's what I'm going to do to this if I'm able, and of course if I'm unable, you'll never see this video. Being rough cast as this is, without being machined, you can see the parting line, and they did snag it, which means to grind it, rough grind it into flatness, but because of pattern draft, I think you know that the high spot here is in the middle, and it tapers off by about two degrees in each direction. And because of that, when the vise is mounted, 
And again, I like that flange, don't you? When the vise is mounted, it is a little tippy. Probably about a sixteenth of an inch. And some people had the concern that these ears can break off. I don't believe this is just a gray iron that would allow that, but some said that it, it would. I think it's a malleable iron, and uh, there's very little chance of, of something this mass, massive getting broken off, which of course would cause the vise to be scrapped. But have you noticed that people refuse to scrap these old vices, no matter how they are? Even after somebody throws them out, there's always somebody that is uh, either too cheap or j just wants to salvage old machinery. Holding a straight edge across it, you can see yeah, it isn't much more than a sixteenth. And a fella could take this with his uh, seven inch grinder and grind some more off the parting line and thereby reduce that. But I am going to attempt to machine this on the Bridgeport Mill. It's not going to be easy because this is a very irregular part that essentially defies being held. In order to hold it in a vise, a milling machine vise, the way I want to, I need to determine whether the face of this jaw is perpendicular to this surface here. Now, I know this is just a carpenter square here, but there isn't enough surface here to set the square against to check that. So I'm going to put the beam of the square in here and bring it up like that and check it. Does that show up? There's too many shadows here. I don't think that shows up too well, but it appears to be pretty darn square. And that is the way I'm going to approach it. But there is another possibility as far as holding it on the vise. But I'm sure at the factories, well, they saved a lot of money by not machining it. No doubt that's what they did. And since they sold these in many different sizes, they probably had to make a fixture for each of the sizes. They didn't uh, hold it just in a regular vise. And they decided not to do that. And this shocked many people, and me as well, considering that they make the fine, the same company makes the fine Parker legendary firearms, which we consider super precision, but yet this isn't that precision. I may or may not mill this surface depending on how rigidly I can hold this thing or how precarious it is. That really doesn't matter too much, but it would be nice to go ahead and machine it while I'm at it. We'll see. Let's go down the basement to the milling machine and think about this a little more. It's about a half hour later and I'm glad to get into the basement shop. It's much cooler down here. Well, I've mounted an angle plate, and I've fiddled around here in different positions, but I think this is the position that I needed. And I thought I had a bigger angle plate, but I'll have to settle for this, and I hope it's rigid enough, but it may not be. So the idea here is to take the vise, and that face that I showed you the other day, or the other hour here, that is going to be up against the angle plate, and hopefully bring this into square, but I wouldn't doubt if it wouldn't need some shimming, and I'm going to check it with the surface gauge, but how the heck would a fella hold this other than run some long threaded rods or bolts, and they would interfere with the machining? Well, who's fooling who? This is the way I planned on doing it from the get-go, so I'm using the vise to clamp itself, kind of like pulling you up at your own bootstraps. Now, I'm out of reach right here, so I can either move the ram out three inches, which is a pain in the neck. That's not too bad, really. Or I think I'll start by moving the angle plate a little bit outboard, as far as I can, with the slots there. Now, I still don't really know if this is going to work, because how true is this? And that's what I'm going to check here in a few minutes. And it's not touching right here. And there's some shims down here to keep, but because there's a bit of a radius on the angle plate. Also, I'm going to lack rigidity here, so I'll probably use some toe clamps here as well. 
and this is really high though that vibration is going to transmit that thing's going to ring like a tuning fork now of course the steroid surface gauge doesn't begin to have the height that it needs to reach up here and check this you know I saw one at a steam show recently just in terrible shape though for nine dollars but it was missing some of the parts but I should have bought it these setups take much longer than the actual cutting operation but I'd like to make sure that this surface here on the vise is perfectly perpendicular to the milling machine table now I can't reach in there with the brown and sharp square because of all kinds of interferences and I had to set the square head onto a parallel because it happens to ride right on the T-slot so again I can't reach up there so using another parallel right here I have determined that it is virtually dead on so I don't have to mess with tilting the entire vise one way or the other that is good real quick analysis here the pattern itself may not have been perfectly accurate or may have moved around in the sand mold but this half appears to be just a little bit higher than this half this is an extra scriber or probe that I had from a surface gauge and I was hoping that I could adapt it or make it fit into this 12 inch or whatever size this is sure Tomiko this is the first time I ever used this uh, this height gauge but rather than spend an hour making something and fiddling around with that I'm simply using the scribe and bringing it up like this and down almost to the casting like that and then move my way along here and you see it's striking right there well let me check it in the middle here and I won't show all of this but if I check it right about by this bolt hole leave a little bit there there's perhaps a 30 second is that showing up perhaps a 30 second and then over here I have to move the table a bit so I can reach without the top of the tool striking the J head and I'm obviously this is the high point so let me move that up to approximately right there Remember that's tapering off as well. About a sixteenth there and a sixteenth there. Now I need to move over to the other side and see what's happening. I know it's going to vary. The reading right here by this hole is almost exactly what it is over on the other side. And it's striking a little bit here. Okay, what I'm going to do is beef up my setting or my, my mounting here a little bit uh, more with some yellow clamps and I'll show you what that looks like. And then I'm going to take a trial cut, just a tiny little cut. And some of you are saying, why isn't he using a dial indicator up here? Well, it's a rough casting and I just prefer this method, but certainly that is a possibility. But a test indicator really is too, ac too, yeah, too accurative, accurative, <laughs> accurate. And sensitive to use up here. I think this is the right way to go, but that's arguable. There's many different ways of doing this. This is the type of attachment that I actually need on the height gauge to perform the measurement that I'm doing right now. Do not have one of those. That's much longer, of course, than what I need. I could have made up something like that, but I didn't want to take the time. This is a brown and sharp. Now let's review this setup. I've tightened this screw quite tight around the angle plate. I've installed a yellow clamp on each side to support that even more. But yet, look at the overhang that we have here. It's just tremendous. What is it? 10 inches from where it's clamped here. You know darn well 
it's going to ring like a tuning fork. So I'm going to put a couple of my homemade jacks under the ram here and snug them up, trying not to influence or jack it up. Take a trial cut and see how that's uh, going to work. The other possibility is some temporary threaded rod, as I mentioned, through these holes that will extend all the way down here and machine around them, then remove them and take a, a final cut. But, you know, I, I'm very leery about this. I'm not leery about it coming loose or anything like that and hurting me. I'm just worried about the surface finish. And the other thing is, remember, this is, has not been machined except where it's been ground. And generally, we consider that fire scale. And taking a light cut is very harmful to the cutters. I, this cutter here is, is a used one. I think I'm going to use it. And I don't really care if I ruin it. And then switch to a Niagara carbide cutter. The idea now is to take some trial cuts in different spots and I know that the depth is going to vary. I'm not very concerned about the final surface finish that I get either, even if there is some chatter, because that's all going to be hidden, of course, when it's mounted upside down on the bench. I have about lost the edge on that dull end mill. Remember, it was kind of dull to start with. That's pretty much shot now, but can you see the pattern here of what I have removed so far? And probably only 10, 12 thousandths is what I have removed at this point. There's a new used three-quarter inch solid carbide cutter. Now look what I did here. To try to cut some of the vibration, I've got yet another clamp. Maybe you can't see it, but there's a long a stud here, threaded stud, and there's the clamp and the backing piece up against the ram, and that's all supported by those jacks, so we'll see if that makes any difference. Wow, did that make a difference, and I really don't know whether it's the sharp cutter or the extra clamping, but probably both contributed to my newfound success. And you can see up to this point, this is all machined, and here is the, the low spot in, in this area that hasn't cleaned yet. But no problem, I'm getting there. You know what, that Parker alloy really machines nicely once you get through that fire scale. And it's pretty well done except for this area here hasn't cleaned up. And uh, another ten thousandths and it will. And I've already taken a couple pass passes across the shoulder here so it won't take much more to clean that up. And that, that should please some of you. Looks good, and I believe I'm done. Now, from the looks of the chips, one little spot here that didn't clean up, but I don't care. The chips look something like cast iron, but not exactly. They're very small, but it's not dust. But look at the graphite. Look at my fingers, how shiny they are and how black they are. So that has some similarity, at least, to working with cast iron, but it must be malleable iron because they, they wouldn't really make a vise out of cast iron. It just wouldn't be strong enough. So it had to be that uh, metal that they call in their catalog Perco or something like that, some alloy that was specified by Perker. 
By the way, did you know that there was a famous jazz saxophonist by the name of Charlie Parker, sometimes called the Bird or the Birdman. In fact, there's still a club in New York that's called, oh, it's called Birdland, I believe is what it's called. Quite famous, long dead. I interrupt this video to tell you that coming out soon will be a 10 part video on making this float lock drill press vise. Also in the future by popular demand I will be rebuilding this cardinal speed vise. But let's get back to what we're really doing here and that is taking a look at the Charlie Parker vise. This far exceeded my expectations. It really looks good. Just a little bit right there that didn't clean up. In fact, it's paint that didn't clean up. Again, I squared off that shoulder so that can butt right up against the vise. And all I need to do now is to take my file and break these corners just a little bit. I don't think I'll paint this. That's hidden anyway. But... And that looks like a monkey, doesn't it? Two eyes and a mouth and a nose. You know, it's 10.30 at night and this old man's tired. I'm going to mount this in the garage tomorrow. And you know, this thing is just heavy enough. i got to take it apart and carry it out <laughs> as two pieces. So, thank you for watching this part. I'm not done. I'll see you in the morning in this same video. It's the next day and I'm back out in the garage and I told you that the bottom of this vise looked a little bit like a monkey's face so I had my grandson Andrew sketch one on there just for the fun of it. Well don't hold your breath for me to machine the bottom of the six inch Perker. I mean that thing is huge and overpowering. It weighs as much as the Bridgeport Mill so that's going to stay as is, and I have at least temporarily taken it out of service anyway, so the point is moot. All right, let's get this thing mounted again. And you can see that butts right up against the table nicely here with a newly machined flange. I had been talking the other day or earlier in the video that I do not care for the swivel bases on vices. So I was recently over at Farm and Fleet by, I mean, three hours ago, and they had quite a complete line of vices there, probably about 10 or 12 of them. None of them or I should say all of them, including these DeWalts, have swivel bases. And all of the ones right here, these are the slightly cheaper ones, but many of these vices are over $100, and I would not trade them even for this whole roll. As a matter of fact, I wouldn't trade them even for my Charlie Parker. Would you, or am I foolish? These are all Chineseium, you know. I am presently in garage number two, and you've seen this Wilton vise before. And you know what? I gotta paint that thing gray. I don't like that color, and I'm the one that painted it that color. But this Wilton vise has real nice pipe jaws in it, not like that Craftsman that I showed you. And it has a swivel base, and I do like the swivel base for this application, particularly when I'm threading pipe, that I can turn it perpendicular to the bench. And then I have plenty of clearance for my rigid uh, ratchet type pipe die. And then this, of course, can be tightened down so it doesn't move. Other than that, I'm not crazy about them. Notice how high this vise is, probably because of that inch and a quarter of the base. And another slight modification I made, the O-rings that I'm using here are too small in diameter, that is the actual diameter of the rubber or butyl or whatever it is, and they get jammed down in this oversized hole. So all of these O-rings I got here in three different selections, I couldn't find what I really needed, so I'm switching to hose washers for garden hoses. That's kind of like what, I don't like the red color, 
And I don't like that slipping there, but that's more or less what Wilton uses in their vices. In the comments, someone said that in their vice, they had a screw and a washer and then a small disc to keep the spring itself from being in contact with the handle. So that is missing or never was in this vise. I don't see there's a whole lot of room for that. I'm glad I did that and the vise really sits nice and flat on the workbench now. So I'm, you know, that's a double thumbs up for what I did and thank you for watching. And now before I conclude the video, and it's a three-parter, make sure you watch all three parts. I have a couple lamentations to share with you. Well here's lamentation number one and I'm sad to tell you this and I could kick myself in the rear end but two weeks ago I went to a steam show and it was a rather small one and I was there on a Friday and they were just opening up and they had a flea market there and it was small and I do mean small and most of the things were crafts which I don't pay any attention to but there was one dealer there that had uh, some tools and he had a huge Wilton vise, that is a six incher. It, I thought, well I can't even lift this thing. It was quite rusty and would have worked just beautifully for a video where I restore it. So I opened it and closed it and it moved freely. It just needed uh, the rust removed. Well, I looked at it and it was marked $125. It was so hot outside, I'm thinking, I couldn't even move this thing, and my car's a mile away, and $125 is too much, and I got 10 vices at home. I do not need another one. This is crazy. So I moved on, and I watched some tractor pulling and sawing on the uh, steam engines and, and all that kind of thing. Well, it's time to leave. Three hours later, I come back. I thought, well, I'll just swing by. Maybe I'll buy it. If you'll take $100 for it, I'll definitely buy it. So I walk, oh, it's still there, great, I can see from a distance. I got closer, and guess what? A big old sign on it that said, sold. So that's why I could quick uh, kick myself in the rear end. And I did, all the way home for that matter. But uh, I'm just as well without it because I've made too many Vice videos anyway. But, you know, that's probably a 500 or $700 Vice and it was only a hundred and a quarter, so I'm going to look that up in a catalog and see if I can show that to you. If I can find it, I'll show you right after this clip, otherwise you won't see it. But, uh, you know, you very seldom run into a deal like that, and here's one that I passed up because I wasn't in the mood. And here's lamentation number two, and it's just a sad story, same as lamentation number one. Well. Two, three, four years ago, I found a Sterrett vise at an auction and I bought it. I had never in my life seen one at an auction and I haven't seen one since. As a matter of fact, that's the only Sterrett vise I ever did see. But not only was it a Sterrett vise, but it was the extra tall one with the sheet metal jaws, and they call it a sheet metal vise smooth uh, jaws as well. In quite good condition, I did paint it. Well, you know, I had my meet and greet last year, and I was cleaning up, and I sold a bunch of stuff. And I thought, well, I'm sick of kicking this thing around and moving it. And I laid it out, and I don't know what I had on it, a hundred, hundred and quarter, or something like that. But when the men came in, it was gone like that. And again, I have seller's remorse, and I'm sick about that. I wish I could get that back, but I don't even know who bought it. But uh, that ends my lamentation. So uh, seller's remorse is a terrible thing. But sometimes when I'm cleaning up, I am merciless in what I get rid of. Here's 300 pounds of vices ready to go into storage until they're needed. Sorry, none for sale. But there's a million of them out there. I am not exactly hoarding them. I only have six. Adam is not hoarding them. There are unlimited quantities, so happy picking. Well, that concludes this series of videos, and I completed on this one 
something that Charlie Parker did not do. So I think I made an improvement, although, as I told you, I like to keep things authentic. And uh, that took away the authenticity, but most of you, I think, will agree that it was uh, a well-needed one. I hope you liked the video. Please subscribe and like if you do like my videos and uh, watch for many more that are coming soon. This is Mr. Pete saying so long for now and I'll see you next time. If my videos are too long and drawn out, tell me so in the comments. and I'm going to cut the length or uh, edit uh, most of them out because uh, I notice that people are only watching 8 to 10 minutes of the average video. And that isn't just for me. I think that most creators will find that out if they look at their analytics.